Next up, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Chris Richardson, who is an EPSRC Research Software Engineering Fellow. So it was interesting uh, to hear Sarah mention these Research Software Engineer Fellowships earlier. Um, it felt like serendipity when I saw that call come out when I was busy organising this. And he's at the BPI Research Institute at the University of Cambridge, and he's one of the core developments, developers of Phoenix. So I think that's what he's going to talk about today. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so what, I, what I'm going to do is hopefully, uh, thank you Jonathan for introducing me, um, quickly whiz through some slides which I've got here, which actually were ones which were produced by my colleague Michal Havira from the University of Luxembourg. So as you can see, we're kind of um, an international team here between quite a few different places. And this was presented first, first um, at the SIAM parallel processing uh, meeting in the spring. But I've edited, edited them quite a lot since then, so it's a little bit different for this, uh, for this talk today. So yes, I'm going to talk about Phoenix X, a sustainable future for the Phoenix project. So first of all, um, what is the Phoenix project? So you might you might have come across it. Um, the idea was it's 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 quite it's a relatively old project now. It's been going for almost 20 years, and the original vision that they had back then was to, as it says, set a new standard in computational mathematical modeling um, with some automation, generality, efficiency, simplicity, and so on. And all this was dreamed up more or less around the early 2000s in Chicago. And so there's a list there of the people who were involved, um, Ridgeway Scott, Matt Nepley, Rob Kirby, and so on. One, one interesting thing is almost none of those are involved today. So um, that's kind of funny how it's moved on from the original contributors to a different set of people now. And the, the name Phoenix FE obviously stands for finite element and the, um, the coat of arms of the University of Chicago has got a phoenix in it, so I, I'm not quite sure how that all came together, but it's something to do with it. And as you can see there, yeah, we, we've had conferences quite a few times. I, I started getting involved around 2012, and we've had conferences um, more or less every year. One in Luxembourg in 2017, which Christoph came to actually, so that was, that was nice to see Christoph again today. And we were going to have one in Cambridge this year, but unfortunately that uh, had to be cancelled. Yes. Yeah, so, what was what was the uh, what were the key breakthroughs that uh, made Phoenix an interesting project and made something that really caught on? Um, was this idea of having a domain-specific language for finite elements? And what you can see over on the right there is a sort of description of an operator. Uh, so, this would be the this is the Laplace operator in weak form, written out in a symbolic language. And that was one of the key innovations: is can we write this in a symbolic language, and then um, which was called UFL, Unified Form Language, and then write some code or something that will turn that into something that can actually be computed. So it actually turns it into some C code with this form compiler, FFC. And that was all, that all kind of took place around the early 2000s. And what actually kind of interesting thing was that Python was the language of choice for doing that. Um, and after they'd done that, they realized actually we can also use Python as a front end for the, um, for the main parts of the code too. So that was, that was kind of an interesting thing that came later on. But anyway, that was the key initial technical um, breakthrough. So I thought, given this is about acoustics, I would uh, present uh, a little bit of code here showing how you would code up the Helmholtz equation, which I guess is something you guys are probably interested in. Um, so it's you know pretty simple. You, you've got some setup here, more or less boilerplate for here's your geometry, mesh, and so on. But the interesting bit is the last two lines where it's basically saying Laplacian operator minus k squared times um, u equals, and then the right, so a is the left-hand side, l is the right-hand side, equals f, f is your forcing function. So you can see it's very simple to write out your equations, and that's a nice thing about it, is you can change the equations, you could make k to be a function of space or time or something, you can do all sorts of funky stuff with it. And because of that, um, there have been a lot of applications built on top of Phoenix, so there are all these things which exist. Phoenix shells for doing thin, thin shells. Multi-Phoenix for doing multi-physics problems, inverse problems. Dolphin adjoint doing adjoint problems of so sensitivity to parameters. Um, Navier-Stokes preconditioning, isogeometric, and so on, and reduced order modeling. So all these things go on. And sometimes we really don't know that these things are happening. And it's just somebody will contact us and say, oh, we've used Phoenix for doing this really cool thing. So, oh, really? Okay. So that's, it's really nice to actually see other people are building on top of it. 
So yeah, um, it's pretty popular. It's been around, say, for a few years. We've got a, a book which was published in 2012, just about when I started getting involved. Um, unfortunately, my name didn't go into it, so I'm not on that citation. But um, which is a, it's a kind of discussion thing with open source software is actually is uh, about citations often a, a real sort of issue. But uh, yeah, anyway, you can see it's been cited a lot. And I did it a couple of years ago. I did sort of a breakdown, I guess, against um, subject area and you can see again that it's a lot of different subject areas that people are using in from biology right through to geophysics and um, fluid dynamics and whatever. So yeah when I joined it was kind of a kind of loose um, collection of academics we're all working on the same projects sort of roughly going in the same direction but no formal structure so when we got to around 2016 and about just after I was uh, applied for, for my fellowship and got my fellowship we really felt the need to have some kind of foundation to make it sort of seem like a real project that's going to have a real future because otherwise a lot of people would easily just say well you know I can see there's a bunch of academics working on this project but you know how do I know that it's still going to be around in five ten years time especially given, as I just said, that the original people who were involved mostly drifted away. So we decided we needed some kind of proper organizational structure. And we looked around for a bit at all the different possible models about having a foundation, setting up a company, becoming a charity, all these kind of things. And a lot of it seemed like a lot of hassle, a lot of legal stuff that you had to get involved with. So what we finally came around to was joining this thing called NumFocus, who would do a lot of this stuff for us. And um, they already had lots of affiliated projects, some of which were kind of nice projects like uh, NumPy, um, Julia, AstroPy, Matplotlib, and so on. So they already got those um, projects involved. And they would deal with all the legal and financial aspects of um, running a foundation and so on. So that was, that was really good. Um, so they're a nice organization. And it's, I can say it's only been positive for us. It's um, given us some kind of stamp of quality i suppose it's given us access to some commercial sponsorship we've got involved with the google summer of code program through them and the other thing that's really important is it actually forced us to make some formal governance documents so we have to think about how we want to run ourselves and write it down and publish it so that was that was really useful um, so now we do have these documents, they're all online. You can go and have a look at them. They're at this website, web address at bitbucket.org. It's a Git repository. And it describes in detail how we are organized. Basically, we've got a steering council, which is a group of people who are the key developers. And the membership of that steering council is decided by um, the contributions that you make. So if you're, if you're making lots of contributions, then um, you're eligible to be put forward to the steering council basically and there's a the idea is that people can step up or step down and it will just keep going forward and we, we with that we have uh, we have monthly meetings and discuss various either technical or organizational aspects um yeah and then we have the summer of code and as i mentioned before michael who actually wrote this presentation originally first got involved for summer of code we also have Igor, who is now going to come and join us as a postdoc. Uh, he's from Brazil, first got involved with Summer of Code, so that's been really nice. Um, another important aspect is getting the workflow tools in place. Um, we've been through a lot of these, that they seem to be really essential. So obviously you need some kind of revision control. Now we're using GitHub, some automated testing and um, some way of actually running that online so we don't have to have our own Jenkins server. So we're using Circle CI and Docker and some community discussion tools. Obviously, we can use Slack as one that we do use. And we've also got Discourse, which again was organized through NumFocus. So yeah, there's, a, there's an easy way for people to contribute if they if they want to, they can just make a pull request and then we it gets run through all the tests, it gets reviewed, and then we can merge it um, on our GitHub site. So that's all pretty straightforward and it's an easy way for people to get involved with contributing but after after we've been running i guess the project is about 15 years old um we really came to a point where we felt we needed to change there was a lot of new tools that become available um new things which didn't exist 15 years ago um like jit compilers for python some new templating libraries new features of c++ new features of mpi 
And the old Phoenix libraries that we had had a lot of faults. And as you can see here, it says they, they're fine if you stayed within the way they were written, but it was difficult to extend them and you couldn't experiment. And also it had tended to drift off in lots of different directions, which were people's research projects, but then got merged into the master branch, but didn't really have proper support. So we decided we're going to have a rewrite and um, keep most things, but delete a lot of stuff and make it a little bit more explicit and more data centric rather than object oriented design. So that has been going on. We published a roadmap of how this is going to happen um, with some of these principles, faster tests. So that previously it would take about half an hour or an hour for the test to run. Now it takes about five or 10 minutes. So it gives a lot more feedback to the to developers. We've done a few things to make the code better. Um, you can discuss that in questions if you like, but uh, basically you just made it better. Um, one of the things that we've really noticed is that we've cut down the line count. We've deleted a lot of stuff. So it's about half the number of lines of C++ and the number of lines of Python is also a lot less, but basically it still has 90% of the functionality it had before. So in conclusion, I think um, one of the most important things is to have some kind of formal structure and governance. You need to think about licensing. That's something I haven't mentioned at all because it really is a big topic, but especially when you're dealing with commercial partners, they're very interested in licensing and how you, how open you really are uh, can be very important. Um, you should be flexible, always open to changing things, delete stuff, delete, delete, delete. It can be very hard, especially people get attached to code they've written, but you have to delete it. That's uh, the case. Looking out for new tools, libraries and methods, engaging with the community, um, and the work just goes on. It's never finished. It's a continuous work in progress. 